Good morning, everyone. I'm Deborah Wiley, and I chair the jury. I, sorry, I'm not the chair of the jury. I am the head of the Wiley Foundation, and I would like to welcome you to the 21st annual Wiley Prize in Biomedical Sciences Award and Lecture, which has always been hosted by Rockefeller University, and thank you very much for that. Over the course of 216 year history of Wiley, we have enjoyed a productive and successful partnership with the scientific community for the advancement of research. We conceived the Wiley Prize in Biomedical Sciences in order to recognize and to give back to that community. Wiley chose to focus on biomedicine because it is an area continuing to experience significant progress and change. Our goal is to recognize specific contributions or a series of contributions that have opened new fields of research or advanced novel concepts or their applications in a particular discipline and demonstrate the nominee's significant leadership in the field. This year's winners, Michael Welsh, Paul Negulescu, Sabine Adida, and Frederick Van Goor have indeed made such a contribution. Their award recognizes a decades-long effort in to determine what is wrong with mutated CFTR, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, in cystic fibrosis patients, and the sub subsequent discovery of three drugs that work in novel ways to correct the folding defects of, mut of the mutant CFTR. Their work has uncovered the cause and treatment for 90% of cystic fibrosis patients, improving their lives the lives of those impacted by this genetic disorder. Our jury consists of Tizia DeLong as chair of our jury, Kai Salakati and Wayne Hendrickson, both of Columbia, John Stites of Yale and Robert Horvitz of MIT, and your own Rick Lifton, who collaborated to make the selection of this year's award recipients. Rick Lifton will serve as the moderator for today's lectures. A Q&A will follow those pre the presentations. May I ask that Ticia join me with the winners to receive their prize. So thank you, Debbie, for always supporting uh, the, the Wiley Prize. I think it's a gem, uh, and that is in part due to the fabulous jury that you mentioned who does so much hard work. Um, we'll now move to the part of this uh, event where each of the recipients will make a short presentation, and that part is chaired by Rick Lifton, president of the Rockefeller, and highly appreciated member of the jury, Rick. Thanks very much. I'm absolutely thrilled to uh, be able to present uh, uh, an introduction to today's festivities. So the surest path to effectively treating a disease is to understand its fundamental causation. The development of recombinant DNA technology in the early 1970s provided a path to the identification, to the unification of physical and genetic maps of genomes from which the ability to map the chromosomal location of disease genes and ultimately discover the underlying gene was uh, established the idea of positional cloning, which could be a revolutionary approach to understanding human diseases that had not yielded to other approaches. So the technology for identifying disease genes has rem advanced remarkably since that time. The development of complete uh, genetic maps of the human genome, followed by painstaking efforts to sequence the human genome, has led to the identification of 2,500 disease genes by positional cloning over the 20 years from 1989 to uh, 2009. Subsequently, the development and implementation of next generation sequencing and exome sequencing and increasingly whole genome sequencing has over the last 14 years provided uh, increasingly inexpensive tools for disease gene discovery that can be performed without prior mapping and has shown that many sporadic severe diseases can be uh, uh, discovered 
uh, uh, can be discovered. And these range from autism to congenital heart disease and are often caused by de novo mutations. And this has increased the number of genes in which rare mutations have large effect in causation uh, to about 4,700. While these are typically rare diseases, uh, many are rare forms of common diseases and point to biochemical pathways that might be modulated for clinical benefit in common diseases, including cardiovascular disease and neurodegeneration. But as satisfying as discovering underly genes underlying human disease, the path to new therapeutics for the large majority of these has proved far more challenging than might have been imagined. The speculation in the 1970s that gene therapy would soon become a routine partner, find a broken gene and replace it uh, uh, with an, uh, an, a normal one, has proved elusive. In fact, the first FDA-approved gene therapy was only registered in 2017, and the application remains challenging, as the ability to reliably deliver gene replacement to desired cells and tissues has remained limiting. Nonetheless, in the last decade, a host of new therapeutic modalities have emerged that are transforming the therapeutic landscape. For a few recessive loss of function diseases, intravenous enzyme replacement therapy can replace a missing protein. And in one clever workaround, administration of two linked antibodies uh, that can take on the role of factor eight in patients with hemophilia A has transformed the lives of children with this bleeding disorder. And in other cases, indirect methods uh, uh, have proved successful. For example, in spinal muscular atrophy, an oral splice modulator uh, or intrathecal oligonucleotides can increase, increase production of the missing protein from an adjacent but normally inactive homolog by altering its splicing. And remarkable progress has been made in the last decade in reducing the activity of gain-of-function mutations or other uh, desired metabolic targets by the use of oligonucleotides or RNA interference. Immune therapies with uh, engineered receptors targeting specific ligands have also found a place uh, in the therapy of B-cell malignancies. And gene editing technologies are making their way into the clinic, primarily at this point by breaking genes, as for PCSK9 and lowering LDL cholesterol, or restoring expression of fetal hemoglobin by preventing its inhibition uh, by the repressor BCL11A uh, in, uh, uh, in, in a variety of hemat uh, hematologic uh, uh, disorders, uh, such as sickle cell anemia. But typically, overcoming loss of function mutations has remained a grand challenge. There are myriad missense mutations that cause most of these diseases uh, and how to overcome these. It was speculated that, well, if we've got 100 different missense mutations, how are we possibly ever going to develop drugs that will target each of these uh, mutations? It seems uh, quite overwhelming. So this year, the Wiley Prize jury found inspiration in the most remarkable series of discoveries that have resulted in the development of effective treatment for cystic fibrosis a previously lethal autosomal recessive disease with incidence of about one in 3,500 newborns in the United States. CF was, in fact, the first human disease gene identified by positional cloning in 1989, uh, and at that time, the normal function of its protein product was a matter of conjecture, and how the missense mutation found in at least one copy in 90% of patients in the United States uh, resulted in disease was wholly unknown. So from this starting point, beautiful biochemical dissection and characterization of the normal function of the CFTR gene product and demonstration of how mutations found in patients abrogated its biochemical function showed precisely what defects would need to be surmounted uh, to attempt to biochemically restore its gene function. While many groups contributed to, to this effort, uh, Michael Welch made key contributions throughout this effort, showing that CFTR is a chloride channel, demonstrating the mechanism of its biochemical activation, the defects that result from the common delta F508 and other mutations in the gene, and critically, the temperature sensitive of the delta F508 uh, mutation. This remarkable body of work showed just how challenging the path forward would be. To biochemically correct the defect, one would need to find a chemical that would correct the folding, and then if this resulted in successfully delivering uh, the protein to the cell surface, one would still need to potentiate the opening of the channel at the cell surface. 
And beyond all of this, it was unknown whether these drugs, even if biochemically successful, would be of any clinical benefit, given that many patients have established lung disease at the time of diagnosis. This deck seemed so stacked against success that it is remarkable that anyone actually took up this challenge. But not only did a fledgling biotech company, Aurora, acquired early on by Vertex, take this on, but they have succeeded in the most spectacular fashion. It is immensely satisfying that the same group of individuals, Paul Neglescu, Sabine Hadida, and Fred Van Gore, have over more than 20 years developed four FDA-approved drugs that in combinations in rigorous clinical trials have demonstrated that they can correct the folding defect and increase the open probability of the channel, uh, and that this, in fact, dramatically improves lung function uh, and other uh, uh, functions in the body, uh, and in fact, uh, improve quality of life and extend the lives of more than 90% of people with cystic fibrosis, and holds promise uh, with early diagnosis and treatment to result in normal, healthy lifespans for these individuals. This is a remarkable body of achievement that not only is a one-off for cystic fibrosis, but has implications for developing, developing therapeutics uh, for other recessive diseases. The first part of today's presentation will feature the basic science of CFTR presented by Michael Welsh, one of today's uh, Wiley Prize winner. Mike is the Carver Professor of Internal Medicine and Molecular Physiology and Biophysics and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at the University of Iowa, where he also directs the Papa John Biomedical Institute. Mike is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's received many honors for his work, including the Warren Alpert Prize from Harvard, the Cobra Medal from the Association of American Physicians, and the Shaw Prize in Life Science and Medicine. As mentioned, Mike has made key contributions to the understanding of the normal and mutant CFTR that set the stage for the development of effective therapeutics. Mike? for a generous introduction. And uh, thank you to the uh, Wiley Foundation, and thank you, Deborah, for being here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about CF first, and then about some of the work. So it's sort of fitting that we're here in New York City for this prize, because New York City has such a tremendous track record of physician scientists impacting cystic fibrosis. And the first of these is Dorothy Anderson. Here's a picture of her receiving an award. In, she's a, she was a pediatrician and pathologist at Columbia, and she's working in the lab uh, at autopsies, looking at the intestine of people that she thought initially might have celiac disease. And as she went on, she looked at their pancreas and saw cysts in the pancreas and fibrosis around the pancreas. And in 1938, she named this disease. She called it cystic fibrosis of the pancreas. And that, of course, is one of the major uh, uh, problems in people with CF. And she also looked at the lungs and saw the same thing there. And that's where we, be, by work from her and others, we began to appreciate the lung disease in cystic fibrosis. And there was another physician scientist here in New York City, Paul de Saint Agnes, also a member of the faculty at Columbia. And in the 1949 heat wave, he noticed that people with CF were prone to dehydration, heat prostration. And he figured out that they had salty sweat. They were losing the sweat, losing the salt in the sweat, the chloride and sodium in the sweat. And so they were at risk from prostration. And the list goes on. People began to see a, a blockage of the intestine with meconium ileus, liver disease, focal biliary cirrhosis. After lung disease and its complications is the second leading cause of death. Males were infertile, and with time, people developed pancreatic disease, and it was quickly appreciated that CF is an inherited disease, an autosomal recessive disease. In any textbook that you pick up, this is the first sentence in the chapter on cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a lethal genetic disease. But all this textbook doesn't capture what it's like to have CF or to take care of somebody with CF. And so I'm going to tell you about the first person I took, saw with CF. I'm a third-year medical student at the University of Iowa. 
And we go in to see this little girl. She's probably seven or eight years old. And as I watch her, she's speaking in short sentences. She's using her accessory muscles of respiration in her neck because she's short of breath. And as we talk, we find out that uh, she has, uh, doesn't have a normal life. She can't go out and do the things that normal kids do. She's spending much of her day with postural drainage, inhalation of aerosols. When she coughed, I, she had this foul sputum. I began to recognize the odor of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the sputum. The, 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 the hard part was when, after seeing her, we went to talk with the faculty. And we learned she might make it to the teens, and she was not going to make it out of her teen years. That made a huge impression on me. It stuck with me all my life. And as a trainee and as a junior faculty, I began to study the airway epithelium that lines the trachea and the bronchi. And this is the epithelium. Here's the apical side. The air would be out here. Here's the basolateral side. And I was interested in how chloride flows across this epithelium and how it's controlled by cyclic AMP. And in doing this, I had in my mind cystic fibrosis because of the high chloride in the sweat. But as I went on, two things pushed me more and more and made me focus totally on cystic fibrosis. And one was I was in the clinic. This is what the lung looked like from a person with CF. Here are two cuts, and so you can see all this yellow stuff is pus, mucus, bacteria, inflammatory cells. And the second thing then was a paper by Paul Quinton, and he was studying the sweat gland duct. And this is a paper that he published in 1983, and here he wrote, abnormally low chloride permeability in cystic fibrosis in the sweat gland duct. And those two things then pushed me more and more, and I wanted to make a difference in this disease. And so I then collaborated with Jonathan Whittacombe, who was at UCSF. He was one of the first people to be able to study these cells, these epithelial cells, in culture. And he got a hold of some epithelial cells from a, a person who had died from CF. He isolated them and cultured them, and we studied them. And the important thing we found was that there was a problem in the airway with chloride getting out of the, uh, out of the uh, airway epithelium. And then uh, what that did was help provide a unifying hypothesis. Chloride defect in permeability in the sweat gland duct, now in the airway, and as time went on, the pancreas, the intestine, on down the list, we began to focus, focus on that. And so, in 1989, as Rick pointed out, things changed. In that year, Lab Chi Choi, Francis Collings, and their colleagues in, published the sequence of CFTR. They found the gene that's mutated in people who have CF. Here's a picture of it. I pasted it in the back of every notebook so I could refer to it all the time. And we were interested in answering this question. This is the first question. If we took this gene, put it into a cell, could, could we correct the defect? Could we correct the chloride permeability defect? And then we had a lot of trouble putting together the sequence. And my colleagues, uh, Alan Smith and, and his group, were the first to be able to put together the full length sequence. It's a long story about why it was so hard, but it was hard. And we were so excited when we got this result. Here was CFTR on a gel. And then we went full in on trying to answer this question. Before I focus on that question, let me pause to tell you two things. In chasing this problem, I was so fortunate to have a tremendous group of colleagues in my trainees. My trainees were fearless. They would do anything, go after anything, to try and solve this problem. The second thing was the environment that we created. Everybody was all in on this. Everybody was contributing. Also, everybody would challenge. They were free to challenge. And they did challenge strategies, priorities. And let me give you an example of that. That was really important to create a really exciting environment. So here's how we went after trying to answer that question. We took cells, grew them on a microscope slide, loaded the cells with an anion-sensitive fluorophore, and looked to see if we changed anion flowing through there. Could we change the brightness of that fluorophore? So I was doing those experiments. And Deborah Rich, my postdoc, was 
taking the cells, doing all the cell work, putting, expressing CFTR or delta F CFTR in it. I'd take those cells, disappear into this little room, and try to get this assay to work. And I'd be in there all day, and I'd come out in, in the, late in the afternoon, and I'd be going around, you know, after a while, showing people in the lab. I'd say, look, 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 this is happening and stuff. And, and I can tell. And they'd sort of nod their heads. <laughs> and I could tell they didn't really, they really didn't buy into what I was saying, but I was pretty sure. And so one day I went to the cell culture incubator to get out the wild type and the delta F5 white CFTR, and it didn't say that. It said A and B. <laughs> My postdoc decided to blind me without asking me, didn't tell me which was wild type and the mutant. I was so happy. Number one, I was really happy because that was the culture I wanted, where everybody could challenge. We were going after this no matter what, and everybody could have an input. The second thing I was happy about, I never missed. So I could, I, I could always tell the difference between those two types of cells, and it, and it just progressively got better. This is an example. Here's normal, here's the delta F CFTR. You can sort of see a little bit in blue. There's some cells there, and variable uh, uh, brightness. Look at the brightness. Here's normal or wild type CFTR. And there's cells here, here, and scattered around. They all get brighter because they have normal CFTR. And so what that did, said was if we put CFTR into a CF epithelial cell, we could correct the chloride transport defect. And it also said putting in CFTR delta F508 the common CF mutation responsible for about 90% of mutations from people who have a Northern European heritage didn't. It indicates that a fluorescence-based assay might be able to report CFDR activity. The next question then was, what does CFDR do? As you look at this name, cystic fibrosis, transmembrane conductance regulator, you don't have any idea what it does. Neither did, the, neither did Lab Chi Choi and Francis Collins and, and, and their uh, uh, colleagues. So they sort of hedged all their bets by saying it might be anything. But if you look back then, the CFDR has a structure a lot like a pump, a lot like this, uh, 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 a type of pump that pumps chemotherapeutics and, and other things out of cells. So there's huge uh, editorials and, and perspectives and news and views about what, what the heck is this pumping out, out of the cell and how is that controlling chloride permeability. We took the simplest approach. We knew this from our work. We were set up and we said, well, the simplest idea, it's a, it's a chloride channel itself. It's not regulating some other channel. It, it's a chloride channel. And so the way we went about doing that is we took a variety of different cells. Here is shown HeLa cells. Here we put CFTR into those cells. And we took a, the, a patch pipette. A patch clamp was fairly newly discovered. And we could put that on the cell and rupture the membrane. And then whatever was in this pipette filled the cell. And so we could control both sides of, of, of this uh, channel with the, the uh, with the anions that, that are going through this cell, whether it be chloride or we could change to bromide or iodide. And with that, we got results like this. So this is a current voltage relationship. So there's current on this axis, the current or the ions flowing through the pore, and across here is the voltage, and this is a key step here, the voltage at which this curve crosses zero. That tells you the most permeable and the least permeable. And so what this did was tell us that bromide goes through, more, is more permeable than is chloride, and iodide's the least permeable. Then we made some guesses. We guessed about what might be the residues lining the pore, and we started to change them, and we changed a lot of those. And I'll show you the results from one. In one case, we converted what, was what had been a positive charge to a negative charge. And we thought, well, that might change the way anions flow through this pore. These are the results we got. We changed from a positive amino acid to a negative amino acid. And when we look at this, what you see is what had been the least permeable, iodide, now became the most permeable, and then bromide, and then chloride. So by changing the structure of this channel, this, this protein, we could change the flow, and we made this conclusion that CFTR is an anion channel, and that then uh, began to link the genetics and the molecular biology and the physiology.
and then it provided a strategy. If you want to discover or test a new therapeutics, you better be looking at anion flow across the membrane. Next question, how does CFDR work? And so we did a lot of studies focused on that. We focused on the part of the, part of the channel that, that sits in the membrane, and we learned that it forms an anion pore, lets chloride and bicarbonate go through. We focused on this region down here called the regulatory domain. We learned that it's phosphorylated and that that increases activity. And then we focused on this, the nucleotide binding domains. They bind ATP at two sites. These sites can hydrolyze ATP or work as a dentalate kinase. Next question then was, okay, what goes wrong? How do you break CFTR? We put in mutations that people had and tried to discover what goes wrong. And I'm going to show you a summary of that work. So this is a cell here. Here's the apical side. This is where normal, normally CFTR sits. It's made. The instructions in the nucleus made in the endoplasmic, endoplasmic reticulum moves off to the Golgi complex, and then it's delivered up here uh, to, uh, to the apical memory. It's a production line. So in CF, the instructions are wrong. There's a mutation in the DNA. And there's a lot of different ways you can break CFTR. One way is a mutation where the protein is never effectively made. The instructions are so bad that you, uh, part of it is missing or it's not, uh, the protein's not made at all. And so if the protein's not made at all, you never have normal function. That's a class one defect. And a lot of people, some people have that, maybe close to uh, 10%. Here's an example of one of the mutations. The common mutation is a class two mutation defective processing. The protein's made in the endoplasmic reticulum, but it's not, it's, it's misfolded. The quality control system doesn't move it on down the line, and it doesn't escape from the ER and go off to the Golgi complex for processing. That's the delta F5 weight mutation that, uh, that excuse me, that, that most people have. Additional mutations led to defective regulation. The channel got delivered. It, came to the right location, but it didn't open, it didn't open enough. And, and so you didn't have enough anion movement through it. And there, a common mutation is G551D. And if another class of mutation is defective conduction. Everything's delivered, it still control, appears to be controlled correctly, but it, anions don't flow through well. The example there is R117H. So these mutation classification system described how mutations disrupt CFDR. They inform genotype phenotype analysis. So if you look at different mutations, might you have milder or more severe type of disease? They gave a blueprint for developing therapeutics. If you're going to develop a therapeutic, you need to know what your target is. Which of these mutations do you want to go after? And then the last question I'll address is can mutated CFDR be corrected? Here's the CFTR run on a gel, and it ha migrates as three bands, creatively named A, B, and C. And so here is the, uh, the sort of the early um, CFTR in that, in that uh, uh, production scheme, and this is the one that gets to the membrane. This is called band C, and you notice how it's sort of wide. It's glycosylated. It has sugars on it, cause it to migrate a little different. That's the mature protein delivered all the way up to the cell surface. And this is wild type CFDR. Here's delta F508 CFDR. It doesn't have any of that mature protein. It's not delivered up to the surface. This is done at 37 degrees centigrade, the temperature uh, of us humans. And we were aware of uh, temperature sensitive mutations in Drosophila, yeast, etc., that were never delivered correct, excuse me, that were never processed correctly, and we wondered, might that be the case here? And so we changed the temperature. If we started lowering the temperature to 30 degrees or 26 degrees or 23 degrees centigrade, we started to see the protein in, coming out, being maturely processed, and it actually got to the cell membrane. And that was so exciting, but getting to the right place, if it never worked, was a problem, and this made us then really excited 
when we lowered the temperature from 37 degrees to 30, and we looked at chloride current here on the y-axis, we started to see current. And that was just, that led to a lot of excitement uh, for us. That said, we're not going to cool people down to 30 degrees centigrade. You can't do that. <laughs> but if you could do this with temperature, if you could do this in the lab, it might be possible to do it in human beings. So, said that defects in CFDR can be corrected, including the common mutant. It said that distinct mutation classes require distinct fixes. You need to know what your target is. Which of these class mutations are you going after? It said that some mutations affect more than one class. The example I just gave you of delta F508 had both a class two defect, didn't get out of the ER well, and a class three defect. Its regulation was somewhat abnormal, didn't open as much as wild type CFDR. It, said it provided approaches and tools for drug development, and it provided a roadmap for developing therapeutics and the confidence to proceed. In ending, I want to tell you two things. One is, this is a, 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 from a, a photo from a few years ago. It's of my lab and, and my colleagues' labs, most of us working on CF. And in this, there's all kinds of people. There's research assistants, postdocs, grad students, faculty, uh, research scientists, uh, administrators. And here is our clinical group. This, this is people in the clinical lab take care of patients with CF. There's physicians, nurses, study coordinators, uh, uh, the whole group of people. And in this group, there's physician scientists, people going back and forth between here and here, speaking both languages, helping us keep our eye on the ball. It was so important for us. The last thing I'll say, there's one other group that was really important. This is a picture of Kava and Thornout, one of our patients, when she was five years old. And she grew up and she participated in so many of our studies. And I'm not talking about studies to test a new drug. I'm talking about studies that just helped us understand the disease. We owe so much to her. I remember one time we're sitting on a bench. Here she's at five years old, but her father was very inventive. He created all kinds of things to try and keep his daughter going. I'm sitting on a bench, I'm talking to her before a study, and I ask her, why are you doing this? And she says, I know this study's not going to help me, but maybe it'll help somebody else. I wanted to cry. It's the most noble human thing. Turns out, it did help somebody else. This is her daughter. Her daughter has CF. Here she's holding a picture of her mom. Her daughter's benefiting from the research that her mother did. And here's her mother. That's why she's smiling. Thank you. Thanks, Mike, for that incredibly inspiring story. Uh, 30 years of work, really extraordinary contributions. And I think Mike's uh, presentation sets the stage beautifully for uh, what comes next, which is uh, therapeutic development. You've heard from Mike how incredibly challenging uh, developing therapeutics uh, for cystic fibrosis uh, was going to be and why it was such a daunting challenge that uh, few uh, took the challenge and uh, uh, the resulting success is just made all the sweeter as a consequence. So the second part of the presentation will be the people who uh, developed the drugs and uh, we'll move on uh, to that. And we'll have three presentations uh, back to back, and at the end of that, we'll open for question and answers uh, to everyone. So the first will be Paul Negulescu. Paul's Senior Vice President of Research at Vertex, where he's currently Disease Area Executive for Vertex's uh, pain program. From 2003 to 2022, Paul was site head at Vertex's San Diego research uh, site, and at that time, uh, they discovered the first CFTR modulators approved for the treatment of cystic fibrosis. Paul also has led uh, Vertex's uh, efforts to discover selective inhibitors of voltage-gated calcium channels as treatments for pain. 
Prior to Vertex, Paul was Senior Vice President of Aurora, whose founders included Roger Chen. Uh, Paul joined as one of their first employees, and when Vertex acquired Aurora in 2001, uh, Paul was responsible for integrating Aurora's research, uh, including the CF and pain programs, to Vertex. I note as an aside that uh, CF was clearly not the major reason for the acquisition of Aurora, uh, and uh, it was really the remarkable work that was going on that uh, was kind of running in the background until suddenly it was successful and became a major fo focus uh, for the company. So um, Paul received both his uh, undergraduate and PhD degrees uh, from Berkeley in physiology and carried out postdoctoral work uh, at, uh, 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 at University of Irvine, uh, and he studied uh, epithelial biology, biophysics, uh, and immunology. Paul was co-recipient of the 2018 Warren Alpert Foundation Prize and the 2022 Pro, uh, Shaw Prize in Life Science and Medicine for his role in the discovery of medicines to treat cystic fibrosis. Paul? Thank you, Rick. Thank you on behalf of Fred, Sabine, and myself to the Wiley Foundation as well for this incredible award and honor and we are delighted to be sharing the award with Mike Welsh today. So Mike uh, touched on a couple of themes that I'm actually gonna um, reinforce, which is the importance of the patients and the importance of teamwork. And on this slide here, this is a photo of one of the first people with CF that I ever met. His, inna his name is Rio, and he was about seven when I first met him, uh, when his family brought him and his uh, brother who also has CF to our site. And this was uh, 20 years before we had uh, any of the CFTR modulators, so it was very early in our work. Uh, and he painted this uh, painting for us, uh, and the colors of it depict how he feels about living with CF, and he has a full range of emotions, as you can see. He's, the yellow is a little bit of hope, uh, the red is a little bit of anger, the black is gloom, and the green is the sticky phlegm that he's always cook, uh, uh, coughing up. So it's people like these that really were there at the very beginning as we were thinking about our work and our, inspire us still today. And then on the right-hand side is a picture of our team, our San Diego research team in 2007. Again, that was five years before the first drug was approved, uh, turning up for a CF a fundraiser walk. And I can tell the age because my kids are there and they're about five or, five or seven, they're in their 20s now. So I'm, we're gonna tell the story in three parts this morning. I'm gonna talk a little about the beginning of our journey to discover these CF medicines, and then and some of the critical milestones along the way. And Sabine will then dive in a little deeper into the molecules themselves, as only she can do as a medicinal chemist. And Fred will follow up and reflect on what these medicines do, how they work, what they teach us about potential for medicines to treat genetic diseases, and also, importantly, how we're gonna to get to every patient with CF. So as, as Mike and Rick uh, both described very well, uh, we started our journey to discover CF medicines on a very strong <clears throat> scientific foundation based on the discovery of the gene uh, in, in 1989 and the work that Mike described that this, uh, determined that the gene encoded a chloride ion channel and that mutations in that gene interfered with the function of that channel. And those deficits, those defects, led to dysfunction and damage in epithelial organs such as the lung, pancreas, GI tract, and reproductive tract, all of which are epithelial organs in which CFTR is expressed. So with this clear story, the question came, well then how do, now we know so much, how do we treat it? How do we solve this medical problem. And there, were really one, there was really one approach initially that the field focused on in the early 90s, which was gene therapy. What if you could just replace the missing gene? And for about a decade, the field worked uh, on that. But as we all know, and as Rick alluded to, gene therapy is not as easy as it sounds. And we're just learning now how to deliver genes to cells. Uh, and so that left a gap in the treatment paradigm for CF. So our journey began in 1999. I was working at a small biotech company called Aurora in San Diego, founded by Roger Chen. 
And we were at the forefront of a new field of drug discovery at that time, which was called high throughput screening. And the idea was to configure assays, often in cells, and add chemicals, compounds to those cells to try to discover drugs. And so the cells would be expressing different uh, targets for drug discovery, and you could screen large chemical libraries with these sorts of uh, assays. And Roger had developed many types of probes that could be loaded into cells, both genetic probes as well as chemical probes, loaded into cells to make them reporters of activity. So Bob Bell, who was the CF, uh, president of the CF Foundation, wondered if this type of technology could be applied to find modulators of CFTR, given the slow progress uh, with gene therapy. So he approached many companies, including us, and many organizations to get them to try to think about this approach. And as Rick mentioned, most turned them down. But two groups, our group at Aurora and Alan Verkman's group at UCSF, did take, take up the challenge. And we took different, different approaches, but we took up the challenge of trying to do high throughput screening to get some chemical starting points that could be uh, evolved into drugs. And Sabine will talk more about that actual process of taking those initial hits and evolving them into drugs, this sort of iterative design cycle. Importantly, when we were uh, specifying what we wanted to achieve, we had two, two initial goals. One was to correct the most common mutation, F508-DEL. We didn't forget about the other mutations, but that one was the one we really wanted to direct most of our effort toward. And the second was to work for, on an oral therapy, work on a pill, because CF does have systemic effects on the human body, not just the lung. So a pill to treat the most common uh, mutation was the initial goal. Start with small molecules to, to discover them in the lab, develop them as medicines, and then provide access uh, to them and bring them to patients. So as Mike nicely outlined, we broke this problem down into its most simplistic components, starting with the left situation, which is normal. Normally, CFTR is expressed at the cell surface where it functions as a chloride ion channel. We knew this from the work of Welsh and others. In CF, and particularly with the F508-DEL mutation, CFTR is stuck inside the cell. It has a full processing defect that results in improper folding and the cell quality control machinery keeps it from getting to the cell surface. So we had to get it from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. The other thing is that we noticed and was shown in the field was that the small amount of correct of CFTR that could get to the cell surface was defective in its channel gating. So we actually had two problems to fix, get it to the surface and get it to gate better. So we thought, well, it, it would be great if we could find one molecule that could do both, correct both defects, the processing defect and the gating defect. But we also thought it might be possible to find molecules that corrected each of those defects separately, because they might be located in different parts of the protein. So we came up with this nomenclature and this approach that we called correctors of protein processing and potentiators of uh, protein function and gating. And the idea with the correctors, ideally, is that they would bind to the CFTR inside the cell and somehow assist it to get to the cell surface. And then a second compound, potentiator, could bind to the CFTR at the cell surface and allow it to open and function as a chloride ion channel. So two types of modulators requiring two types of screens. I'll talk a little about the screens because I'm a screening person, I'm, a, I'm an assay guy, and to me, if, we, if you get the assay right at the beginning, you have a chance to find a drug. If you don't get the assay right, you probably have very little chance to find a drug. So thinking about the assay, thinking about what you want to find is very important. So to discover the potentiators, we took advantage of the finding that Mike Welsh uh, described, which was really critical in our thinking about the program that this was a temperature-sensitive mutation. So we could incubate the cells overnight at low temperature and get the CFTR to the cell surface. And then we could expose those cells to chemical libraries and activate CFTR. It's a cyclic AMP-regulated channel, so we activate it with forscolin. 
And if the compounds were potentiators, they would open the channel and we would see the depolarization of the cell, which we could detect using membrane potential sensitive dyes that Roger uh, had developed. This turned out to be a very specific assay because it was dependent both on the trafficking of the CFTR to the cell surface, the activation of CFTR, and the flow of chloride through CFTR. So it had a very low positive hit rate. The corrector assay was just slight modification of that approach, where instead of incubating in low temperature, we incubated with compounds overnight. Any compounds that were correctors would get the CFTR to the cell surface, and then we incubated with a potentiator to activate the channel, to open the channel, and that allowed the chloride to flow. So just variations on the simple test were able to uh, help us screen large chemical libraries. To move this program along, we actually needed a number of different assays. I'm not going to describe them all, but Fred and Sabine may refer to them in some of their remarks. I described to you the high throughput screening assay using those voltage sensitive dyes, and you can see the NIH 3T3 cells expressing human CFTR that Mike Welsh provided to us and were used in these assays. And then in the middle, the human bronchial epithelial cell model, which Mike also described, and we scaled that model up to be able to test many, many compounds and many, many different conditions using primary airway cells and transepithelial chloride transport as a translational model to confirm that the pharmacology we were seeing in our high throughput assays was translating to a relevant disease model. And then because we couldn't study every mutation that we wanted to in HBEs, we needed a system that would allow us to determine whether our compounds worked on other different types of mutations. And for that, we adapted a Fisher, th Fisher rat thyroid cell line to transepithelial chloride transport measurements, able to be uh, used, use those in the same uh, tr uh, ion transport assays as the HBE, but we could study every uh, mutation that we wanted that way. And we developed automation through the years to make this a very robust um, and reliable process. So through those screens, we ran millions of compounds under diff the different conditions I described. And over, over the years, we discovered multiple classes of modulators, some of which are shown here. As I mentioned, the assay had a very high fidelity of, for detecting uh, CFTR modulators, but we ran the, uh, the hits through secondary assays that were very stringent looking for selectivity for CFTR, as well as confirmation of activity in patch clamp electrophysiology assays. We also used the Western blot as a way to confirm that we were seeing proper processing of the protein as the CFTR gains weight as it uh, matures and moves to the cell surface, which is easily seen on a Western blot. So in the last few minutes, and, and with Mike's uh, remarks in, in addition, we've kind of outlined for you the first phase of this process of discovering the cause of CF, understanding the, the, um, the defects caused by the gene, and those initial steps of configuring uh, elements needed for a drug discovery program. Our screening started in 2001, but there were many steps after that uh, leading to the discovery of the drugs that, that Rick mentioned. And I'll just highlight a couple of key steps along the way. The first was the approval of the CFTR potentiator Kaleidico in 2012. In the ideal world, we would have discovered potentiators and correctors at the same time simultaneously, and we would have been able to, uh, to, to test them in delta F508 first, but life doesn't always give you what you ask for. And in this case, we got the potentiators first. That was what was discovered first. So we took advantage of the fact that there were mutations such as the ones Mike described, where there was just a gating defect in CFTR, such as the G551D. And we were able to show with the potentiator alone that a CFTR modulator could have dramatic clinical benefit. So this was an important proof of concept for the, for the field and for the program, but was only relevant for a small fraction of CF patients. The corrector did eventually come. Uh, we had multiple correctors over the years that were discovered. And the first generation uh, looked like the structure down below. 
Uh, we have two of them in our first generation uh, series, Lumacafter, as well as Tezacafter. And they were both combined with Ivacafter, the potentiator, to treat Delta F patients. However, these first generation correctors were not as efficacious as we would have liked. They provided benefit, but the benefit was modest. And we knew we could do better based on the clinical results as well as our laboratory results. So we continued screening and developing other methods of correction that could be added to and synergistic with the first generation of, cor of correctors. And that work started in, late two, in the late 2000s, around 2010, and around 2016, we had a breakthrough where we discovered a molecule that called Alexacafter, which went, then went through clinical studies in combination with Tezacafter and Ivacafter to become what's now known as the triple combination drug, Trikafta, or three cafters. And that was approved in 2019. That, that's relevant for uh, over 90% of CF patients. We have to get there in stages. We have to show the drug works in lower age groups, and we're not all the way to 90% yet, but we're working to get there with this triple. But that leaves a number of patients still that don't have therapy. So Fred will talk about how we're completing that journey, that journey with additional small molecules and now coming full circle to thinking about genetic-based therapies very large effort that I won't, don't have time to describe today, but just a few uh, examples of the scope of effort over 20 years needed to, to take the discoveries in the lab to patients. So I talked about the screening, I talked about, and Sabine will talk more about the compounds that we synthesized as part of the medicinal chemistry program. We advanced 13 compounds overall to the clinic to find the four that became approved medicines. We conducted 180 clinical studies, that number is probably higher now since we continue uh, studies, and enrolled almost 12,000 patients. Coming back again to Mike's comment, the patients were so important in this journey. If they hadn't signed up for these studies in the numbers they did, in the, times, in the time frame they did, this program would have taken even longer than it has. And we're now at the point where there's a medicine that might be able to treat as much as 90% of pa patients. And we have 50,000 patients who have taken one or more modulators as part of their therapy out of the approximately 80 to 90,000 people with CF worldwide. So more than half now are taking one of these medicines. As someone who has been there since the beginning of this journey, I've come to appreciate the importance of every step going from the left of this slide to the right and all the different types of functions and disciplines and skills needed not just in research, but in clinical development, in manufacturing, in regulatory and government affairs, all the steps needed to bring a medicine uh, to patients. I love that Mike mentioned all, that they were, they were all in. Um, this was a phrase that our CEO around 2017 also rallied us with. Uh, Jeff Lydon said, we're all in for CF, and as one of the uh, ways to illustrate that, he asked everyone in the company to take a little selfie of themselves and write on a post-it note what this journey meant to them. And while I'm not showing you all the notes, I think you can see the scope of the effort from all these folks at Vertex, probably a couple thousand, working on CF at that time. And I'm just going to now hand off to Sabine and Fred, but I'm going to say a couple of things about them, because they've been colleagues with me on this journey for 20 years. But more than colleagues, they become friends. And more than friends, they're, they're like family. Sabine, I think of as the designer. Uh, she has a semi-photographic memory. She can remember almost every of the 48,000 compounds that her group has made. And she can do the SAR in her head, the stru structure activity relationships. And I would put, up, put her up against any chat GBT robot any time. <laughs> So she's, she's really a brilliant scientist with a creative mind. She's a drug hunter, and she'll give you a sense of what that means when she speaks. And Fred, Fred is a driver. So Bean's the designer, Fred's the driver. Fred doesn't let anything stand in his way if he's got a goal that he intends to meet. 
And we had many obstacles along the way, biological, chemical, sometimes the assays weren't working as we needed to. Sometimes we were getting results that were puzzling, which is often the sign that you're learning something. And Fred would take every one of those opportunities to learn. And so I'm so grateful to be here with them uh, to share this award and to share the story. I'll invite Sabine to come up. Thank you, Paul. So uh, what I'm going to do now is just tell you how our team took on the hits from high throughput screening and converted those into IVA captor, TESA captor, and Alexa captor. So um, when uh, we obtain a hit from high throughput screening, this is a chemical, what uh, our team does is just look at the chemical and put forward some hypothesis on how these chemical could be interacting with the target, in this particular case, CFTR. And so what we do is, based on the structure of this compound, make some iterative and small changes to the molecule to try to understand the interaction. So we design a series of compounds. These compounds are there to answer specific hypotheses. Once we have aligned our designs, then those molecules need, we go back to the lab and we need to synthesize those compounds. This process takes days all the way to weeks, and sometimes we need to develop new methodology to be able to synthesize the compound um, that we have designed. Once the compounds are prepared, they need to be purified and characterized, and after that, they get tested in our assays, and we use the information from the assay to try to refine the hypothesis and we do that in an iterative way uh, until we end up with a molecule that is ready to be tested into the clinic. We have to optimize a variety of parameters uh, to be able to end up with a drug. We need to optimize, of course, the potency of the molecule, the efficacy of the molecule, but there are other parameters, like the ability to be uh, orally bioavailable, the potential for drug-drug interaction, the ability to be formulated, the ability to synthesize the molecule from milligram all the way to kilogram, so the synthetic tractability. And of course, we also need to make sure the molecules are safe. So taking, it, optimizing all of these parameters is an incredible science, but it's also an art. And what I'm going to do now is tell you a little bit about those, uh, those examples. So uh, in order to be able to refine our hypothesis, at the time when we were doing uh, this work, there were no cryo-EM structures of compounds uh, with, uh, with ligand co-complex. So what we did is rely uh, fundamentally on the assays uh, that, uh, that Paul and, and Mai described earlier. So uh, we rely on cell-based functional assays uh, in recombinant cells as well as in uh, primary human bronchial epithelial cells. During the entire time of our optimization, we focused, uh, we paid very close attention to the physical chemical properties of the compounds. But at the end of the day, despite that emphasis, we ended up with compounds that did not really uh, follow the drug-like um, uh, rules. Uh, they were uh, pretty large, uh, very lipophilic, uh, highly protein bound, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, we had to rely on stabilized amorphous uh, formulations to be able to deliver them orally. Uh, it was a tremendous amount of work. Uh, as uh, you heard earlier, discovering one drug is hard, discovering two is harder, but three is a daunting task. And the bar graph on the left really gives you a sense of the magnitude of, um, of the effort, uh, the number of compounds that were synthesized through this iterative process. And while it took about 800 compounds to discover Ivacaptor, it took about 3,000 to discover Lumacaptor and Tezacaptor, and uh, 25,000 to get to Alexacaptor. So a really big commitment uh, from our team and from the organization uh, to discover these molecules. So with that, let's now uh, take a deep dive into the discovery of Ivacaptor. As Paul indicated, we started with uh, VRT484. Uh, that was uh, our hit uh, from high throughput screening. And as a, a medicinal chemistry team, what we do is look at the structure and divide the molecule into small uh, 
parts, uh, as I represented here uh, with the, uh, the colorful rectangles, and ask questions, trying to understand how this molecule interacts uh, with, um, with CFDR in this particular case, and use this information uh, to uh, refine uh, the structure. Uh, and uh, through this process, we were able to improve uh, the potency of uh, VRT484 to by 300-fold um, when we reach, we reach IVA capture. And so along the way, this is what we learn. We are building a ligand um, protein uh, model. And what we learn is that the molecule makes some very specific interactions with the target, as we uh, have highlighted here with, uh, with colors. So uh, we learn that uh, they are three important hydrogen bonds with the target in purple. So the uh, hydrogen on the quinolinone, the carbonyl uh, of the amide, as well as the phenol. We also learned that there were a couple of really important uh, lipophilic uh, interactions that were made by the terbutyl uh, here uh, and the phenol of the quinolinone. Very, very fundamental was this intramolecular hydrogen bond between the carbonyl of the quinolinone and the NH. And what this hydrogen bond does is really position the two lipophils and the hydrogen um, bonds in the proper places to be able to interact with CFDR. And then last uh, but not least was this the second terbutyl that we incorporated in the molecule. And the role of this terbutyl was to actually kick the phenol off the plane and reduce the glucuronidation of the phenol, and as a, res as a result, uh, reduce clearance and improve oral bioavailability. So uh, with the potentiator in hand, we now turn our attention to uh, correctors. Uh, our starting point uh, for this effort was a VRT768. This was a very challenging hit to start with. Uh, it was very large. It was very lipophilic. It was very weak, and it was featureless. And so as a medicinal chemist, it was probably one of the worst places to be, but that was the only thing we had. So we had to make the best out of it. And so we apply a very similar process as what I described before, making a very systematic changes to the molecule, uh, focusing on both potency but also efficacy for a corrector, as this is related to the ability to, um, to traffic and process the protein. And through uh, several rounds of optimization, we ended up with tesacaptor. And as you can see, when you compare 768 with tesacaptors, they are very, very different molecules. Uh, the only thing that is common is this amide bond here at the center of the molecule. So that describes a little bit the magnitude of the challenge. Um, so uh, what we learn along the way is uh, the way uh, that each uh, pretty much atom in the molecule is playing a role in the overall profile of the molecule. Uh, and what you can see here is that this uh, portion, the cyclopropyl benzodioxal piece, was critical for efficacy. And actually, this is a conserved motif in all the first generation correctors uh, that we know of. Um, what you can also learn is that there were two parts that were very important for potency. The fluoro here on the indole, as well as this uh, terbutyl uh, part of the molecule. Next, we had to address a drug-drug interaction potential, and we did that uh, by incorporating these two fluorines on the benzodioxal. And then last is this three hydroxys that you see in the molecule. And what those three hydroxys do is really help improve the overall physical chemical property of the molecule and address the biodistribution, particularly targeting the lung. So with um, tesacaptor in hand, it was characterized in our human bronchial epithelial cell um, assays. And uh, what you can see is that it is a corrector. It is able to promote the mature form of CFDR to the cell surface, and that it is additive to ivacaptor. So the, uh, through um, addition of ivacaptor, we see a higher efficacy than with tesacaptor alone or with ivacaptor alone. But very interestingly, um, as part of this, uh, the evolution of this project, is that we noticed that we reached an efficacy ceiling uh, in this first generation corrector. And uh, at this time, um, 
we wonder if it would even be possible to further increase uh, the efficacy uh, of correction with a small molecule. And so we went back to the basic science and tested the combination of temperature correction, uh, that you can see here by Western blot, with uh, VX809, which was our, uh, the other first generation corrector that Paul um, um, showed on the slide. Both of them are good correctors, and we, when we combined them together, we were able to see significantly increased uh, correction efficacy. And this was the basis uh, to uh, in the initiation of a new high throughput screening, this time testing in combination with Lumacaptor and Ivacaptor. And through this effort, we identified multiple scaffolds. We worked on all of them, but the one that uh, led to Alexa Cafter is this compound VRT768. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of this um, scaffold. So, um, this time, all of our opti optimization was done in combination. And we approach a similar um, approach as what I described before, divide the molecule into small bits and try to uh, make systematic changes and see how that impacts the uh, activity, being potency as well as efficacy. And uh, what I'm showing here on the graph is the evolution of potency here in green as well as efficacy in purple over time. Um, so this was a multi-year effort. So um, we took um, about 25,000 molecules to get to Alexa Kafter. But what you can see here, which was very, very interesting to us, is that this was actually different than what we had seen with our first generation correctors. Here, as we made changes to the structure, the efficacy continued to increase. We did not reach the same plateau as, that we had with the first generation. And we really took advantage of that to get to highly efficacious um, modulator combinations. Um, another interesting point is that potency and efficacy were not always correlated. Sometimes we uh, improved uh, efficacy and potency would go down. Sometimes we, uh, potency would plateau while efficacy increased. And we had to work through this to be able to integrate all the parameters and get to uh, Alexa Kafter. And so, uh, again, when we characterize uh, the triple combination um, of Ivacaftor, Tezacaftor, and Alexacaftor, you can see that we are getting uh, high levels of efficacies, and we are able to triple the efficacy of uh, the Ivacaftor, Tezacaftor combination. So now I'm going to pass it on to Fred, who's going to tell you about the impact of these molecules uh, and what we learned from them. But before we go, I would like to acknowledge uh, Peter Grutenhus. Uh, Peter Grutenhus was the project leader uh, of, 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 this, uh, of the team, and he drove the team to the discovery of Iva Kafter, Tessa Kafter, and Alexa Kafter. He was a great mentor and a, a good friend to us, and he passed away uh, in 2019, just a few weeks before the approval of, of the triple combination. And uh, I wish he could be here uh, with us today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, some of the insights that we gained along the way and some of the impact of these um, molecules. And I'm going to uh, start where Sabine left off. You know, Sabine described how uh, she and her team walked around the molecule, changing each atom and optimizing each atom uh, using cell-based assays to paint a picture of how these molecules are interacting with the CFTR protein. And it wasn't until after we discovered these therapies that we first got our first glimpse, or vi we were able to visualize how each of these different molecules bind to CFTR using a method called cryo-EM uh, electron microscopy. Um, this is some internal data of uh, where uh, this is CFTR here, the uh, structure of CFTR with Ivacaftor around the back. Uh, you have uh, Lexacaftor here and Tezacaftor here. And there's also some uh, beautiful work by Ju Chen, who has also shown very similar um, uh, pictures um, as we've uh, as shown here. What I want you to notice is three things. First, all three of the molecules bound to distinct sites on the CFTR protein 
to have a complementary mechanism of action to enable us to reach those high levels of CFTR function that Sabine talked about. The second thing I want you to notice is that they're all bound within this lipid bilayer. And that was uh, the first explanation for why uh, we needed to bend the traditional medicinal chemistry rules, because they liked to be in this lipid bilayer. They didn't look like drugs were supposed to be, but they sure acted like um, uh, medicines. And the last thing I want you to notice is that they all bind away from where the primary defect in the CFTR protein is, is caused by f 508 del So by acting away from this primary defect, you can still restore delta f 508 CFTR function to high levels. But we've talked a lot about f 508 del CFTR. It's by far the most common mutation in people with cystic fibrosis. But there are hundreds of mutations in people with CF many of which occur in one, two, or three people in the world. And each one of these little dots on here represents a mutation in a person with cystic fibrosis. Like delta F508, they can cause defects in the amount of the CFTR protein at the cell surface um, and or how it functions at the cell surface. So we needed a systematic way to test the response to CFTR modulators um, in, um, in each of these different individually rare CFTR mutations. And to do that, we developed an in vitro um, uh, assay where we had a panel of Fisher rat thyroid cells, each individually expressing one of these CFTR mutations. And what we found was that 175 of the 235 mutations that we tested were responsive to Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, and Ivacaptor. And what's really cool about this scientifically is that by binding to these specific sites, you can have an allosteric effect on multiple different mutant CFTR forms. But what's really important is that each one of these dots represents a mutation in a person with cystic fibrosis. And because there were so many, and in many cases very rare, it was very impractical to be able to study each of these in a clinical trial. And so what we did is that we took to the FDA this in vitro data showing that uh, these mutations were indeed responsive to the triple combination therapy. We extensively had already extensively studied the safety in larger populations of people with CF and demonstrated clinical benefit. And with this together, we were able to expand benefit to approximately 7% of the CF, uh, CF population based on the in vitro data. So it's really a, a, an important question, like how can these three medicines or three uh, uh, compounds bind to this specific site and work on so many different mutant CFTR forms? And before I get into telling you how they do that, just let me tell you a little bit about the structure of CFTR. So CFTR has this lasso region, which kind of wraps around the transmembrane domains and is important for the folding and the function. You have these membrane spanning domains, these two membrane spanning domains that form the pore or the door of the channel. And then you have uh, these nucleotide binding domains, which are connected or anchored to these membrane spanning domains and that's really important because these nucleotide binding domains act like the engine that opens and closes the door formed by these two membrane spanning domains. And what we found is that tezacaftor binds to one of these membrane spanning domains. And it helps to keep this membrane spanning domain together, more stabilized. We call these, uh, they sort of stabilize the intradomain stability of that MSD1. Alexacaftor, on the other hand, kind of spreads across the different membrane-spanning domains, MSD1, MSD2, and then this lasso region to keep this domain-domain interactions together. And that's really important because for the CFTR protein to get out of the cell to the cell surface and then work properly, 
these different domains have to come together properly and work, to, uh, work properly. So, Tesla Captor works by improving CFTR processing as an intra domain stabilizer. Alexa Captor works by inter domain uh, stabilizing the different domains, but how they work together. So, Tesla Captor works early in CFTR biogenesis, and that provides, we believe, more substrate for Alexa Captor to then work on. And that is why Tesla Captor can improve the potency and efficacy of Alexa Captor. So that's a little bit about how they work. But now I'm going to move to the impact of these uh, uh, three compounds on uh, people with cystic fibrosis. So as you've seen, in the absence of CFTR modulators in cells, in this case, uh, derived from a person with one F508-DEL mutation and a mutation on the other side that doesn't respond to CFTR modulators because it doesn't make any CFTR protein. When we add the triple combination, we see a large increase in the amount of chloride transport in vitro. So how do you measure that in people with CF? And Mike mentioned um, that sweat chloride uh, is a direct measure of CFTR function. In fact, in people with cystic fibrosis, you have very salty skin, and that's about a, you can measure that to be about 100 millimoles per liter sweat chloride. Um, people without cystic fibrosis or who don't have disease have sweat chloride levels down below 30 millimolar. And then around 60 millimolar is the diagnostic threshold for cystic fibrosis. In other words, if you had sweat chloride levels between 160, uh, you could be diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. Less than that, you may or may not get full uh, symptoms of cystic fibrosis. And what we're finding out now is that the triple combination therapy can improve CFTR function um, to levels of uh, 45 millimole per liter. In fact, 79% of people on the triple combination therapy have sweat chloride levels below the diagnostic threshold. So why is that important? Well, these large improvements in CFTR function lead, lead to um, large improvements in lung function, in this case measured um, as the FEV1. We got a, almost a 14% improvement in, in lung function. And that's an acute measure and one measure of the benefits. But there are several others, and this is some of the data showing the real world impact in over 16,000 people on the triple combination therapy. We're seeing a 74% reduction in mortality, an 87% reduction in transplants, 77% reduction in pulmonary exacerbations, and almost 80% reduction in hospitalizations. And more recently, um, there was some um, modeling work done to show that the projected survival in people um, on the best standard of care is moving from 38 uh, years of age to almost 72 years of age on the triple combination therapy. But these are all very clinical measures of how people are doing on these medicines. What we really enjoy is all of the stories that we hear from people with cystic fibrosis. And just a couple of examples of those here are uh, Lindsay, um, who ran a marathon. Uh, she has cystic fibrosis, and she's won one of our medicines and was able to run a marathon. Others start to think about how um, they're going to be able to uh, have a future and live their lives um, and, 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 and continue uh, to um, uh, just, in, you know, in, uh, live their lives uh, to the fullest. So what we've talked about here is, uh, to date, we can get about 90% of people with cystic fibrosis have access to at least, um, or a potential to be treated by at least one CFTR modulator uh, therapy. But we're not done yet. Um, our work continues to further improve CFTR function to achieve levels um, uh, that are found in people with no disease, it's important, you know, you're born with cystic fibrosis, and it's important to be able to treat as early in life as possible. And finally, there's about 10% of people with cystic fibrosis who don't respond to one of our CFTR modulators because they don't make any CFTR protein. And we recently advanced into the clinic with our partner Moderna, a CFTR mRNA therapy um, that can be delivered to the lung cells and produce normal CFTR um, protein. 
you know, it's very difficult to capture all of the um, insights and challenges over the last 20 years of drug discovery. Um, and I hope you were able to see a few of these challenges and insights that we were able to highlight here. But more importantly, drug discovery is more of a human story. It is one of the hardest things we as a society can do is develop drugs. It takes great endurance to stick with it through the hard times and the good times. It takes fearless pursuit of science to solve the hard biological and chemical problems. And as all journeys, it takes sacrifice. And at times, the sacrifice of those that you love and cherish the most. Um, we're always in the lab working on these problems. And I can't imagine uh, three people that I would have rather taken this journey with than Paul, Sabine, and Peter over the last 20 years. And I really want to thank you um, for being there. Um, but more importantly, none of us would be here without the community. The community of physicians and scientists, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. You know, I was in Mike Wells' lab 20 years ago learning how to culture these cells. And your papers were such a foundation for what we did, and, and it was many hours of enjoyable reading. Um, the many, many people at Vertex um, who not only discover, but develop, but ensure that people with CF get access to these medicines. And lastly, the people with CF the patients and their families that have inspired us for all of these years to continue to find medicines to treat all people with cystic fibrosis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a terrific session. I'd like to invite this, all of the speakers uh, up, and uh, we'll have time for a few questions and answers, and hopefully. So please come on up. Questions? <clears throat> Maybe I'll start with a, a question of uh, Fred and the group. Uh, so we saw the modeling results of uh, 71 years uh, life expectancy. Uh, what does that assume in terms of when therapy is initiated? Uh, as you drive, I mentioned the earlier the better. What was the uh, underlying assumption there? And do you think if you start uh, at birth, whether uh, that number uh, will get up to normal lifespan for uh, the population? Yeah, that was a, a general assumption that, that um, assumed um, uh, that um, y y it was a general assumption that if you started therapy, um, you know, at, in, in 18 years old and, and older, that you would have that kind of decline that would then model out to that. Um, but that paper also looked at if you started younger. So if you started at 12 years old, it actually went up to 82 years of age. And if you went even younger, you know, you know who knows? Hopefully, the dream would be to have a normal uh, lifespan. Uh, thank you all for your, your roles in this really, truly remarkable story. So one of the things that's apparent from the way these drugs work and from looking at Delta F508 is that Delta F508 looks a lot like a traditional temperature sensitive mutation that people have studied in model organisms for many years, and that the drugs in some way, perhaps in, in multiple different ways, enhance the thermal stability of the protein. And, and I wonder if there's ways to think about for diseases that are caused by point mutations in general, that just screening for drugs that increase thermal stability, even if the mutations are not explicitly temperature sensitive, just screening for enhanced thermal stability would be something that where um, you would have uh, helpful modulators uh, of protein function outside of CFTR, right? That's, that's certainly an approach you could take to look for just binding that, that produces a protein stability shift. And in fact, the correctors that we've looked at do increase thermal stability. Uh, 
but they often do it in a very narrow range, and it's often a very small signal. So what we, where we ended up is that probably the function, having a functional assay is probably a more sensitive way to do the screen than the way we can measure thermal stability today. Perhaps if we get better at measuring the binding and thermal uh, stability, it would be a, a more generalizable approach. Wayne? I have a question for Sabine. I uh, was marveling at your progression from a screening hit to a final compound. Uh, you seem to find some resemblance, but I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and so my question really relates to the process, and I'm wondering, is it really truly uh, a succession of small changes that ultimately, all of which you can track through it, or were there steps that were kind of leaps that maybe it really completely changed the way it was doing things in some fashion? You see what I'm... Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good question. It's actually a combination of both. Uh, we usually just, uh, we, make some, we use a combination of space, um, evaluation in our molecules, so uh, as well as making very kind of traditional small changes. And we look at the activity that these changes, uh, in, the changes in activity that these uh, changes um, impart in a variety of properties. And then we have to just, we have a, a, a big spread of information and we have to integrate it and then project it again into the next generation of molecules that we make. So it's a combination of both. And I'll, just add, back here. I'll just add, though, that to take advantage of what Sabine is saying, the assays have to be, again, very sensitive and detect very small changes in activity. As, as few as a few percent activity in correction or potentiation help in that figuring out if you're making small progress or big leaps. You need to be able to see both. Hi, thank you. I may have missed this, but I'm wondering, is there, are there plans to combine the mRNA therapy with the tri-therapeutic for people with the more common mutations? I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly possible. You know, I think where we're focusing on is uh, people that don't have any, uh, you know, uh, potential to be uh, uh, benefited by CFTR modulators. So we're focused on those that don't make any CFTR protein. Um, you could, in theory, add a CFTR modulator on top of a CFTR mRNA to further improve the function, um, and that's certainly one of the things that we'll be looking at. Yeah, so I'm wondering, like, even for people with this, like, form that's not trafficked properly, if you just gave them the RNA therapy, would that be enough without the tri-therapeutic? Yeah, it could be an, an enough. I think one of the things that um, we've learned over the years, though, is that uh, CF is obviously a, a, a multi-organ disease, and the CFTR modulators, you know, have a great benefit in the lung, but they also benefit mm -hmm. organs throughout the body. Um, because the CFTR mRNA therapies have to be delivered to the lung only, oh, okay. you know, we're sort of focusing the CFTR mRNA therapies on on the lung and and continuing to to focus on CFTR modulators for for the vast majority. Okay. Thank you. Beth, I guess. <laughs> That's one for well, Sabine. <laughs> well, I think, um, I think the structures would have explained the physical chemical property in which we are. Um, one thing that I wanted to share, uh, that I think I wanted to share is that our uh, model of ligand protein interaction is actually pretty close to what we see in the cryo -EM structures. You know, the, I'll only add, you know, it's, it's, it's gratifying to see now that we have the structure, to see, you know, where they're, where they're binding, and it is giving us some important insights, mm -hmm. you know, at the molecular level on how these uh, compounds might, might be working to reinforce a lot of what we learned from the biochemistry and, um, and um, you know, other, other approaches. So it's, it's cool. David? Question for Mike, beautiful talk. Over the years, do you think that, have you learned that there are different functions in the different tissues, or do you think the best model is whether it's sweat chloride, lung, gut, et cetera, pancreas, that it's really one set of functions? What have you learned? I know you've made the pig models and studied many other tissues. 
How should we think about that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question, particularly as was just pointed out. If we're successful at gene therapy or gene editing in the lung, what about all the other sites? The beautiful thing about the modulators and correctors, it doesn't matter where CFTR, it corrects it everywhere. So what about, you know, now we're worried about uh, uh, diabetes. As people get older, they have diabetes. How is CFTR affecting, you know, the, the, the problem with insulin secretion? How is CF, CFTR is in the brain, right? Tiny bit, but it doesn't take much channel in a neuron to affect function. So when people start on the modulators and they describe blue lightning, what does that mean? What does that mean? Why is that happening? If you think about this, we just, we just, just did a big metabolomic study looking at what goes into an organ and what comes out of an organ across, across multiple organs simultaneously using the CF pig versus a wild type pig. And it's striking, things I had not anticipated. I don't know what, what's going on. As today, I, can, I think that all, wherever we understand what's going on, it's related to the channel function. When CFTR was first described, there were lots of thoughts about it's because the misfolding causes a problem, not in the channel, but generally in the cell. Lots of different ideas. Um, we don't have direct evidence yet that any of the, you know, some of those might be playing a role. I, I don't know. But today, everything where I can understand something, it's channel. Well, I think that's a good place to uh, leave the discussion. Again, I want to congratulate everyone for their remarkable contributions and the impact on uh, the health of patients with cystic fibrosis is just dramatic and uh, the ability to uh, correct the folding of a protein, promote its uh, opening, uh, it's really a remarkable achievement and uh, quite a heroic accomplishment. So uh, again, congratulations to everyone and thanks for your remarkable contributions.